what was the writing process like for you guys? I mean, I'm imagining notepads, you know, uh, you know, uh, cassettes, uh, you know, just totally different world than we kind of live in today for how you for how you take stuff down. How did you how what was the process like for you guys? So typically uh, one of us would come to the rehearsal hall with a, uh, an idea and I would play a riff and then a, a lyrical phrase um, or Paul would have a, a riff or half a song written. Mike would have a bass part or something. We positioned a cassette recorder in the middle of the room. We found the ultimate sweet spot for it to be able to pick up all the instruments, even though it was just, you know, like just a simple monophonic microphone picked up because we had a little, uh, little mini PA system in our rehearsal hall. So we found the sweet spot and we just hit record and then we would play the ideas. Sometimes we just let it run for hours and then Paul would go back home and listen through and pick out segments that he thought were <clears throat> worthy of further development. Um, yes, lots of note taking, um, lots of lyrical, you know, ideas scrunched up and thrown away. And um, I took notes. I, most of it, I, I just sort of memorized, but there were times when I had my manuscript out and I'm writing ideas out and um, making sure that I, you know, can remember some idea that I had that, I don't want to, I don't want to lose it because we're moving quickly through to another idea, but that's kind of how the process was. It's just work. It's just, um, it, it, you had to be patient because the technology was certainly nowhere what it is today where you can, you know, but, but the creative process still requires work. There's just no other way around it. You have to kind of stick to it and, and put in the hours to come up with ideas that, that will see the light of day. Is there, uh, what songs or song from Loverboy would you say probably have your personal influence stamped on them the most? Or were they always this collaborative effort? Yeah, they were all pretty collaborative, I would say. I mean, uh, we all kind of threw in our, our ideas. I always came up with my own keyboard parts and um, Paul would have some ideas. And I, I, my job was to embellish and to stay out of the guitar's way, basically trying to find my place because um and and likewise if i had a keyboard centric song say for instance a song like uh, take me to the top which has this big synthetic intro um big analog synthesizer intro well he found a great place with his his wah guitar and um if he had been playing big you know power chords it wouldn't work because i had already occupied that space in terms of the sonic feel so that's what we did we kind of found our place in in when we're building this ultimate stack of, of, of uh, sound, you have to find your place within that. And that was, uh, that was a challenge. So I would say, um, take me to the top was, uh, obviously that came from keyboards. Um, there was a lot of uh, cuts like uh, DOA from the first album that was uh, pretty keyboard heavy. There was like, actually, there's keyboards in uh, every song. There's keyboard, um, you know, parts that are pretty, I would say, um, uh, crucial to the, the character and personality of the song. Um, and that's kind of what we, what we did. We all contributed to that creative process. Do you have a particular favorite touring memory, like one you're never going to forget because it means so much to you? Okay, so being the keyboard player and, and having, we just spoke of the song, Take Me to the Top, we were playing in Baltimore probably 1981 first album had come out done okay and the 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 uh, u.s record company kind of um skeptically released our first album in in the states they only pressed i think 10,000 copies initially not, not expecting it to do much um and we proved them wrong thankfully uh but our second album had was out and they released it in the u.s also um and it started to get traction on, on FM radio. And um, uh, so working for the weekend was starting to get lots of places. So always take me to the top and, and in different places. It, for, it was very interesting to see what places uh, sort of favored the different songs on the, on the record. So we're in Baltimore, we're, we're at this massive festival uh, opening up for Foreigner and uh, 
Journey, and uh, it was just a, a I think Joan Jett was on the bill, the Scorpions. And we're, we're like the third man up and we're, we're out there. We're on our third song. I think it was Get Lucky. And it was like, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a, this is a bit of a slog. I don't know if this is going to work. You know, this is a tough crowd. And uh, so I, we're now I'm transitioning into uh, Take Me to the Top. I do a little keyboard solo and then I go into the, to the song. So there's a little pause, a little pregnant pause. And then boom, 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 boom. And I go into the song. So between that pause and between me starting that that uh, in introduction introductory note pattern everybody in the JFK stadium stood up on their feet and cheered like this crazy yeah with their fists in the air when i started taking me to the top and i was absolutely blown away i i got chills up my spine just from the response that we got and everybody in the band turned to me and went, yeah, you know, like, this is great. I think we got him. And uh, so unbeknownst to us, Take Me to the Top was a very highly played uh, track in the Baltimore area. And um, so when we went into it, it was just uh, amazing, the response that we got. So that's one of many great memories that I have uh, of the early days, certainly. And, and you, you know, you, you were talking about earlier how you play a multitude of, of different types of instruments, and, and you certainly have not been a one-trick pony for the last, I'd say, 40 years. I understand you have been or had been composing for cinema. What drew you to that? Uh, I think when we took a break between 1988 and 1993, I just kind of turned my attention to writing music for some films and some TV shows. And I actually worked for, believe it or not, an, an ad jingle company that, in Vancouver. And that was really educational. And uh, I learned a lot about, um, you know, what, what goes into the art of crafting a branding piece of music and that sort of thing. Um, and then I turned my attention to, um, uh, some movies. I did a movie called uh, Chained Heat 2, which was kind of a bit of a spicy thing back in the, I think it was 1991, 92 when that came out, it was with Bridget Nielsen. Remember she married Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone, Stallone. called yeah. Danish woman? Yeah, oh, yeah. She was a, Ended up with Flava Flav. Yeah, boy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. So anyways, that was a, that was a starting point. And um, I did some other things after that. And then I got into doing a lot of documentary um, work for on TV docu documentary series. Um, and lately, I've, that's kind of where my focus has been. I did a movie a couple of years ago called River Blue, which is a documentary that examines the uh, environmental impact of the garment industry in the third world. So the camera crew went all around the world to, you know, South America, to Southeast Asia, Africa, uh, in all throughout Asia, basically um, documenting, documenting what's happening when you have these huge uh, corporations that are going into these countries with impunity and basically contaminating the local water supply with all of their affluent that's, affluent that's coming out of their manufacturing process. So this is, that's what it was called, River Blue, because there's some rivers in China when they're making denim jeans that turn blue from the dye that they just release into the local river. And of course it's causing all kinds of health problems for the mm -hmm. local population. And uh, so th it was a bit of a downer, the movie. I mean, it's, it was real eye opener for me and certainly made me more aware of my, my, um, you know, buying uh, choices when it comes to clothing. Um, there are a lot of different clothing now that has less of an impact on, if you look for it, you know, on the environment. So, um, and then I did another one called um, The Last Paddle about a very famous guy who, um, it was sort of connected, there's almost a sequel to that movie and uh, about his life uh, traveling the world, um, the, the world's river system and documenting the health of, of the planet's rhythm, uh, river systems, so. Yeah, so then now I'm doing uh, a, a documentary series that I'm starting right now, actually, I'm working on it now. It's called uh, Northern Air Rescue. 
and it follows three female pilots uh, who live in northern Canada. They have a small airline there, there and they do all these search and rescues. They do um, supply delivery runs. They do all this sort of really death-defying stuff because the weather up there is just so unpredictable. And they're in these little planes. And uh, so they're making a series, kind of a reality TV series about how these women are able to cope with the challenges of being in that place and being a female and being a pilot at the same time. So, um, yeah, I, I, I enjoy doing it because you, we go on the road and especially during, you know, the COVID lockdown, that's kind of what I did. And uh, uh, I missed playing, but I also really enjoyed working um, on these different projects. So. 